Part 1, Chapter 5 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 1, Chapter 5. 1. My idea is to become a Rothschild. I invite the reader to keep calm and not to excite himself. I repeat it. My idea is to become a Rothschild, to become as rich as Rothschild. Not simply rich, but as rich as Rothschild. What objects I have in view, what for and why, all that shall come later. First, I will simply show that the attainment of my object is a mathematical certainty. It is a very simple matter. The whole secret lies in two words, obstinacy and perseverance. We have heard that. It's nothing new, people will tell me. Every Vater in Germany repeats this to his children. And meanwhile, your Rothschild, James Rothschild, the Parisian is the one I mean, is unique while there are millions of such Vaters. I should answer. You assert that you've heard it, but you've heard nothing. It's true that you're right about one thing. When I said that this was very simple, I forgot to add that it is most difficult. All the religions and the moralities of the world amount to one thing love virtue and avoid vice one would think nothing could be simpler but just try doing something virtuous and giving up any one of your vices just try it it's the same with this that's why your innumerable german fathers may for ages past reckoning have repeated those two wonderful words which contain the whole secret and meanwhile rothschild remains unique it shows the same idea but not the same and these fathers don't repeat the same idea no doubt they too have heard of obstinacy and perseverance, but to attain my object, what I need is not these German Vaters of obstinacy or these Vaters perseverance. The mere fact that he is a Vater, I don't mean only the Germans, that he has a family, that he is living like other people, has expenses like other people, has obligations like other people, means that he can't become a Rothschild, but must remain an average man. I understand quite clearly that in becoming a Rothschild, or merely desiring to become one, not in the German Vater's way, but seriously, I must at the same time cut myself off from society. Some years ago I read in the newspaper that on one of the steamers on the Volga there died a beggar who went about begging in rags and was known to everyone. On his death they found sewn up in his shirt 3,000 rubles in notes. The other day I read of another beggar of the respectable sort who used to go about the restaurants holding out his hand. He was arrested, and there was found on him 5,000 rubles. Two conclusions follow directly from this. The first, that obstinacy in saving even the smallest coin will produce enormous results in the long run. Time is of no account in this. And secondly, that the most unskillful form of accumulation, if only persevering, is mathematically certain of success. Meanwhile, there are perhaps a good number of respectable, clever, obstinate people who cannot save either three or five thousand, however much they struggle, though they would be awfully glad to have such a sum. Why is that? The answer is clear. It is because not one of them, in spite of all their wishing it, desires it to such a degree that, for instance, if he is not able to save by other means, he is ready to become a beggar and so persistent that after becoming a beggar he will not waste the first farthing he has given on an extra crust of bread for himself or his family with this system of saving that is in beggary one must live on bread and salt and nothing more to save up such sums at least so i imagine that is no doubt what the two beggars i have mentioned above did do they must have eaten nothing but bread and have lived almost in the open air there is no doubt that they had no intention of becoming rothschilds they were simply Harpagons or Ilyushkins in their purest form, nothing more. But when there is intelligent accumulation in quite a different form with the object of becoming a Rothschild, no less strength of will is needed than in the case of those two beggars. The German Vater does not show such strength of will. There are many kinds of strength in the world, especially of strength of will and of desire. There is the temperature of boiling water and there is the temperature of molten iron. One wants here the same thing as in a monastery, the same heroic asceticism. Feeling is wanted, not only idea. What for? Why? Is it moral and not monstrous to wear sackcloth and eat black bread all one's life to heap up filthy lucre? These questions I will consider later. Now I am discussing only the possibility of attaining the object. When I thought of my idea, and it was forged in white heat, I began asking myself, 
Am I capable of asceticism? With this object, for the whole of the first month, I took bread and water, not more than two and a half pounds of black bread a day. To do this, I was obliged to deceive Nikolai Semyonovich, who was clever, and Marie Ivanovna, who was anxious for my welfare. Though I wounded her and somewhat surprised Nikolai Semyonovich, who was a man of great delicacy, I insisted on having my dinner brought to my room. There, I simply got rid of it. I poured the soup out of window onto the nettles or elsewhere. The meat I either flung out of window to a dog or wrapping it up in paper put it in my pocket and threw it away after, and so on. As the bread given me for dinner was much less than two and a half pounds, I bought bread on the sly. I stood this for a month, perhaps, only upsetting my stomach a little, but the next month I added soup to the bread and drank a glass of tea morning and evening, and I assure you I passed a year like that in perfect health and content as well as in a moral ecstasy and perpetual secret delight. Far from regretting the dainties I missed, I was overjoyed. At the end of the year, having convinced myself I was capable of standing any fast, however severe, I began eating as they did and went back to dine with them. Not satisfied with this experiment, I made a second. Apart from the sum paid to Nikolai Semyonovich for my board, I was allowed five rubles a month for pocket money. I resolved to spend only half. This was a very great trial, but after at most two years I had in my pocket by the time I went to Petersburg, 70 rubles saved entirely in this way, besides other money. The result of these two experiments was of vast importance to me. I had learned positively that I could so will a thing as to attain my objects. And that, I repeat, is the essence of my idea. The rest is all nonsense. 2. Let us, however, look into the nonsense too. I have described my two experiments. In Petersburg, as the reader knows, I made a third. I went to the auction and at one stroke made a profit of seven rubles, 95 kopecks. This, of course, was not a real experiment. It was only by way of sport and diversion. I simply wanted to filch a moment from the future and to test how I should go and behave. I had decided, even at the very first in Moscow, to put off really beginning till I was perfectly free. I fully realized that I must, for instance, finish my work at school. The university, as the reader knows already, I sacrificed. There is no disputing that I went to Petersburg with concealed anger in my heart. No sooner had I left the grammar school and become free for the first time than I suddenly saw that Versilov's affairs would distract me from beginning my enterprise for an indefinite period. But though I was angry, I went to Petersburg feeling perfectly serene about my object. It is true I knew nothing of practical life, but I had been thinking about it for three years and could have no doubt about it. I had pictured a thousand times over how I should begin. I should suddenly find myself as though dropped from the clouds in one of our two capitals. I pitched on Petersburg or Moscow for my beginning, and by choice Petersburg, to which I gave the preference through certain considerations. Perfectly free, not dependent on anyone, in good health and with a hundred rubles hidden in my pocket as the capital for my first investment. Without a hundred rubles, it would be impossible to begin, as without it, even the earliest period of success would be too remote. Apart from my hundred rubles, I should have, as the reader knows already, courage, obstinacy, perseverance, absolute isolation, and secrecy. Isolation was the principal thing. I greatly disliked the idea of any connection or association with others until the last moment. Speaking generally, I proposed beginning my enterprise alone. That was a sine qua non. People weigh upon me, and with them I should have been uneasy, and uneasiness would have hindered my success. Generally speaking, all my life up to now, and all my dreams of how I would behave with people, I always imagined myself being very clever. It was very different in reality. I was always very stupid, and I confess sincerely, with indignation, I always gave myself away and was flustered, and so I resolved to cut people off altogether. I should gain by it independence, tranquility of mind, and clearness of motive. In spite of the terrible prices in Petersburg, I determined once for all that I should never spend more than 50 kopecks on food, and I knew I should keep my word. This question of food I had thought over minutely for a long time past. I resolved, for instance, sometimes to eat nothing but bread and salt for two days together, and to spend on the third day what I had saved on those two days. I fancied that this would be better for my health than a perpetual uniform fast on a minimum of 15 kopecks. Then I needed a corner, literally a corner, solely to sleep the night in and to have a refuge in very bad weather. 
I proposed living in the street, and if necessary, I was ready to sleep in one of the night refuges where they give you a piece of bread and a glass of tea as well as a night's lodging. Oh, I should be quite capable of hiding my money so it should not be stolen in the corner or in the refuge and should not even be suspected. I'll answer for that. Steal from me? Why, I'm afraid of stealing myself, I once heard a passerby in the street say gaily. Of course, I only apply to myself the caution and smartness of it. I don't intend to steal. What is more, while I was in Moscow, perhaps from the very first day of my idea, I resolved that I would not be a pawnbroker or usurer either. There are Jews for that job, and such Russians as have neither intelligence nor character. Pawnbroking and usury are for the commonplace. As for clothes, I resolved to have two suits, one for every day and one for best. When once I had got them, I felt sure I should wear them a long time. I purposely trained myself to wear a suit for two and a half years, and in fact I discovered a secret. For clothes always to look new and not to get shabby, they should be brushed as often as possible, five or six times a day. Brushing does not hurt the cloth. I speak from knowledge. What does hurt it is dust and dirt. Dust is the same thing as stones if you look at it through the microscope, and however hard a brush it is, it is almost the same as fur. I trained myself to wear my boots evenly. The secret lies in putting down the whole sole at once, and avoiding treading on the side. One can train oneself to this in a fortnight. After that, the habit is unconscious. In this way, boots last on an average a third as long again. That is the experience of two years. Then followed my activity itself. I started with the hypothesis that I had a hundred rubles. In Petersburg, there are so many auction sales, petty hucksters booths, and people who want things, that it would be impossible not to sell anything one bought for a little more. Over the album, I had made seven rubles, 95 kopecks profit on two rubles, five kopecks of capital invested. This immense profit was made without any risk. I could see from his eyes that the purchaser would not back out. Of course, I know quite well that this was only a chance, but it is just such chances I am on the lookout for. That is why I have made up my mind to live in the street. Well, granted that such a chance is unusual, no matter. My first principle will be to risk nothing, and the second to make every day more than the minimum spent on my subsistence, that the process of accumulation may not be interrupted for a single day. I shall be told that all this is a dream. You don't know the streets, and you'll be taken in at the first step. But I have will and character, and the science of the streets is a science like any other. Persistence, attention, and capacity can conquer it. In the grammar school, right up to the seventh form, I was one of the first. I was very good at mathematics. Why, can one possibly exaggerate the value of experience and knowledge of the streets to such a fantastic pitch as to predict my failure for certain? That is only what people say who have never made an experiment in anything, have never begun any sort of life, but have grown stiff in second-hand stagnation. One man breaks his nose, so another must break his. No. I won't break mine. I have character, and if I pay attention, I can learn anything. But is it possible to imagine that with constant persistence, with incessant vigilance and continual calculation and reflection, with perpetual activity and alertness, one could fail to find out how to make 20 kopecks to spare every day? Above all, I resolved not to struggle for the maximum profit, but always to keep calm. As time went on after heaping up one or two thousand, I should, of course, naturally rise above second-hand dealing and street trading. I know, of course, far too little as yet about the stock exchange, about shares, banking, and all that sort of thing. But to make up for that, I know, as I know I have five fingers on my hand, that I should learn all the stock exchange and banking business as well as anyone else, and that the subject would turn out to be perfectly simple because one is brought to it by practice. What need is there of the wisdom of Solomon so long as one has character? Efficiency, skill, and knowledge come of themselves. If only one does not leave off willing. The great thing is to avoid risks, and that can only be done if one has character. Not long ago in Petersburg, I had before me a subscription list of shares in some railway investments. Those who succeeded in getting shares made a lot of money. For some time, the shares went up and up. Well, if one day someone who had not succeeded in getting a share or was greedy for more had offered to buy mine at a premium of so much percent, I should certainly have sold it. 
People would have laughed at me, of course, and have said that if I had waited, I should have made ten times as much. Quite so, but my premium is safer, for it's a bird in the hand while yours is on the bush. I shall be told that one can't make much like that. Excuse me, that's your mistake, the mistake of all our Kokarevs, Polyakovs, and Gubanins. Let me tell you the truth. Perseverance and persistence in money-making, and still more in saving, is much more effective than these cent-percent profits. Not long before the French Revolution, there was a man called Law in Paris who invented of himself a scheme that was theoretically magnificent, but which came utterly to grief in practice afterwards. All Paris was in excitement. Law's shares were bought up at once before allotment. Money from all parts of Paris poured as from a sack into the house where the shares were subscribed. But the house was not enough at last. The public thronged the street. People of all callings, all classes, all ages, bourgeois, noblemen, their children, countesses, marquises, prostitutes, were all struggling in one infuriated, half-crazy, rabid mob. Rank, the prejudices of birth, and pride, even honor, and good name were all trampled in the same mire. All, even women, were ready to sacrifice anyone to gain a few shares. The list at last was passed down into the streets, but there was nothing to write on. Then it was suggested to a hunchback that he should lend his back for the time as a table on which people could sign their names for shares. The hunchback agreed. One can fancy at what a price. Sometime, a very short time after, they were all bankrupt. The whole thing went smash. The whole idea was exploded and the shares were worth nothing. Who got the best of it? Why? The hunchback. Because he did not take shares, but Louis d'Or in cash. Well, I am that hunchback. I had strength of will enough not to eat and to save 72 rubles out of my kopecks. I shall have strength enough to restrain myself and prefer a safe profit to a large one even when everyone around me is carried away by a fever of excitement. I am trivial only about trifles, not in what is important. I have often lacked fortitude for enduring little things ever since the inception of my idea, but for enduring big things I shall always have enough. When in the morning my mother gave me cold coffee before I set out to work, I was angry and rude to her, and yet I was the same person who had lived a whole month on bread and water. In short, not to make money, not to learn how to make money, would be unnatural. It would be unnatural, too, in spite of incessant and regular saving, unflagging care and mental sobriety, self-control, economy, and growing energy. It would be unnatural, I repeat, to fail to become a millionaire. How did the beggar make his money if not by a fanatical determination and perseverance? Am I inferior to a beggar? And after all, supposing I don't arrive at anything, suppose my calculation is incorrect, suppose I fall and come to grief, no matter, I shall go on. I shall go on because I want to. That is what I said in Moscow. I shall be told that there is no idea in this, absolutely nothing new. But I say, and for the last time, that there are an immense number of ideas in it, and a vast amount that is new. Oh, I foresaw how trivial all objections would be, and that I should be as trivial myself in expounding my idea. Why? What have I said, after all? I haven't told a hundredth part of it. I feel that it is trivial, superficial, crude, and somehow too young for my age. 3. I've still to answer the questions what for and why, whether it's moral and all the rest of it. I've undertaken to answer them. I am sad at disappointing the reader straight off, sad and glad too. Let him know that in my idea there is absolutely no feeling of revenge, nothing Byronic, no curses, no lamentations over my orphaned state, no tears over my illegitimacy, nothing, nothing of the sort. In fact, if a romantic lady should chance to come across my autobiography, she would certainly turn up her nose. The whole object of my idea is isolation. But one can arrive at isolation without straining to become a Rothschild. What has Rothschild got to do with it? Why this, that besides isolation, I want power. Let me tell the reader, he will perhaps be horrified at the candor of my confession, and in the simplicity of his heart will wonder how the author could help blushing. But my answer is that I'm not writing for publication, and I may not have a reader for ten years, and by that time everything will be so thoroughly passed, settled, and defined that there will be no need to blush. And so, if I sometimes in my autobiography appeal to my reader, it is simply a form of expression. 
my reader is an imaginary figure. No, it was not being illegitimate with which I was so taunted at two shards, not my sorrowful childhood. It was not revenge nor the desire to protest that was at the bottom of my idea. My character alone was responsible for everything. At 12 years old, I believe, that is almost at the dawn of real consciousness, I began to dislike my fellow creatures. It was not that I disliked them exactly, but that their presence weighed upon me. I was sometimes in my moments of purest sincerity quite sad that I never could express everything even to my nearest and dearest. That is, I could, but will not. For some reason I restrain myself so that I'm mistrustful, sullen, and reserved. Again, I have noticed one characteristic in myself almost from childhood, that I am too ready to find fault and given to blaming others. But this impulse was often followed at once by another which was very irksome to me. I would ask myself whether it were not my fault rather than theirs, and how often I blamed myself for nothing. To avoid such doubts, I naturally sought solitude. Besides, I found nothing in the company of others, however much I tried and I did try. All the boys of my own age, anyway, all my schoolfellows, all, every one of them turned out to be inferior to me in their ideas. I don't recall one single exception. Yes, I am a gloomy person. I am always shutting myself up. I often love to walk out of a room full of people. I may perhaps do people a kindness, but often I cannot see the slightest reason for doing them a kindness. People are not such splendid creatures that they are worth taking much trouble about. Why can't they approach me openly and directly? Why must I always be forced to make the first overtures? That is the question I ask myself. I am a grateful creature and have shown it by a hundred imbecilities. If someone were frank with me, I should instantly respond with frankness and begin to love them at once. And so have I done, but they have all deceived me promptly and have withdrawn from me with a sneer. The most candid of them all was Lambert who beat me so much as a child, but he was only an open brute and scoundrel. And even his openness was only stupidity. Such was my state of mind when I came to Petersburg. When I came out from Dergachev's, and goodness only knows what made me go to him, I had gone up to Vassin, and in a rush of enthusiasm, I had begun singing his praises. And that very evening I felt that I liked him much less. Why? Just because by my praise of him I had demeaned myself before him, yet one might have thought it would have been the other way. A man just and generous enough to give another his due, even to his own detriment, ought to stand higher in his personal dignity than anyone. And though I quite understood this, I did like Vassin less, much less, in fact. I purposely choose an example with which the reader is familiar. I even thought of Kraft with a bitter sickly feeling because he had led me into the passage, and this feeling lasted till the day when Kraft's state of mind at the time was revealed and it was impossible to be angry with him. From the time when I was in the lowest class in the grammar school, as soon as any of my comrades excelled me in schoolwork or witty answers or physical strength, I immediately gave up talking or having anything to do with them. Not that I disliked them or wished them not to succeed. I simply turned away from them because such was my character. Yes, I thirsted for power. I've thirsted for it all my life. Power and solitude. I dreamed of it in an age when everyone would have laughed at me to my face if they could have guessed what was in my head. That was why I so liked secrecy. And indeed, all my energy went into dreams, so much so that I had no time to talk. This led to my being unsociable, and my absent-mindedness led people to more unpleasant conclusions about me, but my rosy cheeks belied their suspicions. I was particularly happy when, covering myself up in bed at night, I began in complete solitude, with no stir or sound of other people around me, to recreate life on a different plan. I was most desperately dreamy up to the time of the idea, when all my dreams became rational instead of foolish, and passed from the fantastic realms of romance to the reasonable world of reality. Everything was concentrated into one object. Not that they were so very stupid before, although there were masses and masses of them. But I had favorites. There is no need to bring them in here, however. Power! I am convinced that very many people would think it very funny if they knew that such a pitiful creature was struggling for power. 
but I shall surprise them even more, perhaps from my very first dreams, that is, almost from my earliest childhood. I could never imagine myself except in the foremost place, always and in every situation in life. I will add a strange confession. It is the same, perhaps, to this day. At the same time, let me observe that I am not apologizing for it. That is the point of my idea. That is the force of it, that money is the one means by which the humblest non-entity may rise to the foremost place. I may not be a non-entity, but I know from the looking glass that my exterior does not do me justice, for my face is commonplace. But if I were as rich as Rothschild, who would find fault with my face? And wouldn't thousands of women be ready to fly at me with all their charms if I whistled to them? I am sure that they would honestly consider me good-looking. Suppose I am clever, but were I as wise as Solomon, someone would be found wiser still, and I should be done for. But if I were a Rothschild, what would that wise man be beside me? Why, they would not let him say a word beside me. I may be witty, but with Talleyrand or Pierron, I am thrown into the shade. But if I were a Rothschild, where would Piron be? And where Talleyrand even, perhaps? Money is, of course, despotic power. And at the same time, it is the greatest leveler, and that is its chief power. Money levels all inequality. I settled all that in Moscow. You will see, of course, in this idea, nothing but insolence, violence, the triumph of the non-entity over the talented. I admit that it is an impudent idea, and for that reason, a sweet one. But let it pass. You imagine that I desire power to be able to crush, to avenge myself. That is just the point, that that is how the commonplace would behave. What is more, I am convinced that the thousands of wise and talented who are so exalted, if the Rothschild's million suddenly fell to their lot, could not resist behaving like the most vulgar and commonplace, and would be more oppressive than any. My idea is quite different. I'm not afraid of money. It won't crush me, and it won't make me crush others. What I want isn't money, or rather money is not necessary to me, nor power either. I only want what is obtained by power, and cannot be obtained without it. That is, the calm and solitary consciousness of strength. That is the fullest definition of liberty for which the whole world is struggling. Liberty. At last I have written that grand word. Yes, the solitary consciousness of strength is splendid and alluring. I have strength and I am serene. With the thunderbolts in his hands, Jove is serene. Are his thunders often heard? The fool fancies that he is asleep. But put a literary man or a peasant woman in Jove's place, and the thunder would never cease. If I only have power, I argued, I should have no need to use it. I assure you that of my own free will I should take the lowest seat everywhere. If I were a Rothschild, I would go about in an old overcoat with an umbrella. What should I care if I were jostled in the crowd, if I had to skip through the mud to avoid being run over? The consciousness that I was myself, a Rothschild, would even amuse me at the moment. I should know I could have a dinner better than anyone, that I could have the best cook in the world. It would be enough for me to know it. I would eat a piece of bread and ham and be satisfied with the consciousness of it. I think so even now. I shouldn't run after the aristocracy, but they would run after me. I shouldn't pursue women, but they would fly to me like the wind, offering me all that women can offer. The vulgar run after money, but the intelligent are attracted by curiosity to the strange, proud, and reserved being, indifferent to everything. I would be kind, and would give them money, perhaps, but I would take nothing from them. Curiosity arouses passion. Perhaps I may inspire passion. They will take nothing away with them, I assure you, except perhaps presents that will make me twice as interesting to them. To me, enough the consciousness of this. It is strange but true that I have been fascinated by this picture since I was seventeen. I don't want to oppress or torment anyone, and I won't, but I know that if I did want to ruin some man, some enemy of mine, no one could prevent me, and everyone would serve me, and that would be enough again. I would not revenge myself on anyone. I could never understand how James Rothschild could consent to become a baron, 
Why, for what reason, when he was already more exalted than anyone in the world? Oh, let that insolent general insult me at the station where we are both waiting for our horses. If he knew who I was, he would run himself to harness the horses and would hasten to assist me into my modest vehicle. They say that some foreign count or baron at a Vienna railway station put an Austrian banker's slippers on for him in public, and the latter was so vulgar as to allow him to do it. Oh, may that terrible beauty, yes, terrible there are such, that daughter of that luxurious and aristocratic lady meeting me by chance on a steamer, or somewhere glance askance at me and turn up her nose, wondering contemptuously how that humble, unpresentable man with a book or paper in his hand could dare to be in a front seat beside her. If only she knew who was sitting beside her, and she will find out. She will, and will come to sit beside me of her own accord, humble, timid, ingratiating, seeking my glance, radiant at my smile. I purposely introduced these early daydreams to express what was in my mind, but the picture is pale and perhaps trivial. Only reality will justify everything. I shall be told that such a life would be stupid. Why not have a mansion? Keep open house. Gather society round you. Why not have influence? Why not marry? But what would Rothschild be then? He would become like everyone else. All the charm of the idea would disappear. All its moral force. When I was quite a child, I learned Pushkin's monologue of the miserly night. Pushkin has written nothing finer in conception than that. I have the same ideas now. But yours is too low an ideal, I shall be told with contempt. Money, wealth, very different from the common wheel, from self-sacrifice for humanity. <laughs> but how can anyone tell how I should use my wealth? In what way is it immortal? In what way is it degrading that these millions should pass out of dirty, evil Jewish hands into the hands of a sober and resolute ascetic with a keen outlook upon life? All these dreams of the future, all these conjectures seem like a romance now, and perhaps I am wasting time in recording them. I might have kept them to myself. I know, too, that these lines will very likely be read by no one, but if anyone were to read them, would he believe that I should be unable to stand the test of the Rothschild millions? Not because they would crush me, quite the contrary. More than once in my dreams I have anticipated that moment in the future when my consciousness will be satiated and power will not seem enough for me. Then, not from ennui, not from aimless weariness, but because I have a boundless desire for what is great, I shall give all my millions away, let society distribute all my wealth, and I, I will mix with nothingness again. Maybe I will turn into a beggar, like the one who died on the steamer, with the only difference that they wouldn't find money sewn up in my shirt. The mere consciousness that I had had millions in my hands and had flung them away into the dirt like trash would sustain me in my solitude. I am ready to think the same even now. Yes, my idea is a fortress in which I can always at every turn take refuge from everyone, even if I were a beggar dying on a steamer. It is my poem, and let me tell you I must have the whole of my vicious will simply to prove to myself that I can renounce it. No doubt I shall be told that this is all romance, and that if I got my millions I should not give them up and become a beggar. Perhaps I should not. I have simply sketched the ideal in my mind. But I will add seriously that if I did succeed in piling up as much money as Rothschild, that it really might end in my giving it all up to the public, though it would be difficult to do so before I reached that amount. And I shouldn't give away half, because that would be simply vulgar. I should be only half as rich, that would be all. I should give away all, all to the last farthing, for on becoming a beggar, I should become twice as rich as Rothschild. If other people don't understand this, it's not my fault. I'm not going to explain it. The fanaticism, the romanticism of insignificance and impotence, people will pronounce. The triumph of commonplaceness and mediocrity. Yes, I admit that it is in a way the triumph of commonplaceness and mediocrity, but surely not of impotence. I used to be awfully fond of imagining just such a creature. 
commonplace and mediocre, facing the world and saying to it with a smile, You are Galileos and Copernicuses, Charlemagnes and Napoleons. You are Pushkins and Shakespeare's. You are field marshals and generals, and I am incompetence and illegitimacy. And yet I am higher than all of you because you bowed down to it yourself. I admit that I have pushed this fancy to such extremes that I have struck out even my education. It seemed to me more picturesque if the man were sordidly ignorant. This exaggerated dream had a positive influence at the time on my success in the seventh form of the grammar school. I gave up working simply from fanaticism, feeling that lack of education would add a charm to my ideal. <laughs> now I've changed my views on that point. Education does not detract from it. Gentlemen, can it be that even the smallest independence of mind is so distasteful to you? Blessed he who has an ideal of beauty, even though it be a mistaken one. But I believe in mine. It is only that I've explained it clumsily, crudely. In ten years, of course, I should explain it better, and I treasure that in my memory. 4. I finished with my idea. If my account of it has been commonplace and superficial, it is I that am to blame and not the idea. I have already pointed out that the simplest ideas are always the most difficult to understand. Now I will add that they are also the most difficult to explain. Moreover, I have described my idea in its earliest phase. The converse is the rule with ideas. Commonplace and shallow ideas are extraordinarily quickly understood and are invariably understood by the crowd, by the whole street. What is more, they are regarded as very great and as the ideas of genius but only for the day of their appearance. The cheap never wears. For a thing to be quickly understood is only a sign of its commonplaceness. Bismarck's idea was received as a stroke of genius instantly, and Bismarck himself was looked on as a genius, but the very rapidity of its reception was suspicious. Wait for ten years, and then we shall see what remains of the idea and of Bismarck himself. I introduce this extremely irrelevant observation, of course, not for the sake of comparison, but also for the sake of remembering it, an explanation for the too unmannerly reader. And now I will tell two anecdotes to wind up my account of the idea that it may not hinder my story again. In July, two months before I came to Petersburg, when my time was all my own, Marie Ivanovna asked me to go to see an old maiden lady who was staying in the Troitsky suburb to take her a message of no interest for my story. Returning the same day, I noticed in the railway carriage an unattractive-looking young man, not very poorly, though grubbily dressed, with a pimply face and a muddy, dark complexion. He distinguished himself by getting out at every station, big and little, to have a drink. Towards the end of the journey, he was surrounded by a merry throng of very low companions. One merchant, also a little drunk, was particularly delighted by the young man's power of drinking incessantly without becoming drunk. Another person who was awfully pleased with him was a very stupid young fellow who talked a great deal. He was wearing European dress and smelt most unsavory. He was a footman, as I found out afterwards. This fellow got quite friendly with the young man who was drinking, and every time the train stopped, roused him with the invitation, It's time for a drop of vodka. And they got out with their arms round each other. The young man who drank scarcely said a word, but yet more and more companions joined him. He only listened to their chatter, grinning incessantly with a driveling snigger, and only from time to time, always unexpectedly, brought out a sound something like, Tour Lulu, while he put his finger up to his nose in a very comical way. This diverted the merchant and the footman and all of them, and they burst into very loud and free and easy laughter. It is sometimes impossible to understand why people laugh. I joined them too, and I don't know why. The young man attracted me too, perhaps by his very open disregard for the generally accepted conventions and proprieties. I didn't see, in fact, that he was simply a fool. Anyway, I got onto friendly terms with him at once, and as I got out of the train, I learned from him that he would be in the Tvorskoy Boulevard between 8 and 9. It appeared that he had been a student. I went to the boulevard, and this was the diversion he taught me. We walked together up and down the boulevards, and a little later, as soon as we noticed a respectable woman walking along the street, if there were no one else near, we fastened upon her. Without uttering a word, we walked one on each side of her, and with an air of perfect composure, as though we didn't see her, began to carry on a most unseemly conversation. 
We called things by their names, preserving unruffled countenances as though it were the natural thing to do. We entered into such subtleties in our description of all sorts of filth and obscenity as the nastiest mind of the lewdest debauchee could hardly have conceived. I had, of course, acquired all this knowledge at the boarding school before I went to the grammar school, though I knew only words, nothing of the reality. The woman was dreadfully frightened and made haste to try and get away, but we quickened our pace too, and went on in the same way. Our victim, of course, could do nothing. It was no use to cry out. There were no spectators. Besides, it would be a strange thing to complain of. I repeated this diversion for eight days. I can't think how I can have liked doing it, though indeed I didn't like doing it. I simply did it. At first I thought it original, as something outside everyday conventions and conditions. Besides, I couldn't endure women. I once told a student that in his confessions, Jean-Jacques Rousseau describes how as a youth he used to behave indecently in the presence of women. The student responded with his tour le I noticed that he was extraordinarily ignorant and that his interests were astonishingly limited. There was no trace in him of any latent idea such as I had hoped to find in him. Instead of originality, I found nothing in him but a wearisome monotony. I disliked him more and more. The end came quite unexpectedly. One night, when it was quite dark, we persecuted a girl who was quickly and timidly walking along the boulevard. She was very young, perhaps sixteen or even less, very tidily and modestly dressed, possibly a working girl hurrying home from work to an old widowed mother with other children. There's no need to be sentimental, though. The girl listened for some time and hurried as fast as she could with her head bowed and her veil drawn over her face, frightened and trembling. But suddenly she stood still, threw back her veil, showing, as far as I remember, a thin but pretty face, and cried with flashing eyes, Oh, what scoundrels you are! She may have been on the verge of tears, but something different happened. Lifting her thin little arm, she gave the student a slap in the face which could not have been more dexterously delivered. It did come with a smack. He would have rushed at her, swearing, but I held him back, and the girl had time to run away. We began quarreling at once. I told him all I had been saving up against him in those days. I told him he was the paltriest commonplace fool without the trace of an idea. He swore at me. I had once explained to him that I was illegitimate. Then we spat at each other, and I've never seen him since. I felt frightfully vexed with myself that evening, but not so much the next day, and by the day after I had quite forgotten it. And though I sometimes thought of that girl again, it was only casually for a moment. It was only after I had been a fortnight in Petersburg I suddenly recalled the whole scene. I remembered it, and I was suddenly so ashamed that tears of shame literally ran down my cheeks. I was wretched the whole evening, and all that night, and I am rather miserable about it now. I could not understand at first how I could have sunk to such a depth of degradation, and still less how I could have forgotten it without feeling shame or remorse. It is only now that I understand what was at the root of it. It was all due to my idea. Briefly, I conclude that, having something fixed, permanent, and overpowering in one's mind, in which one is terribly absorbed, one is, as it were, removed by it from the whole world, and everything that happens, except the one great thing, slips by one. Even one's impressions are hardly formed correctly. And what matters most, one always has an excuse. However much I worried my mother at that time, however disgracefully I neglected my sister, Oh, I've my idea. Nothing else matters, was what I said to myself, as it were. If I were slighted and hurt, I withdrew in my mortification and at once said to myself, Ah, I'm humiliated, but still I have my idea, and they know nothing about that. The idea comforted me in disgrace and insignificance, but all the nasty things I did took refuge, as it were, under the idea. It, so to speak, smoothed over everything, but it also put a mist before my eyes, and such a misty understanding of things and events may, of course, be a great hindrance to the idea itself, to say nothing of other things. Now, for another anecdote. On the 1st of April last year, Maria Ivanovna was keeping her name day. Some visitors, though only few, came for the evening. Suddenly, Agrafienna rushed in, out of breath, announcing that a baby was crying in the passage before the kitchen and that she didn't know what to do. We were all excited at the news. We went out and saw a bark basket, and in the basket a three or four weeks old child crying. 
I picked up the basket and took it into the kitchen. Then I immediately found a folded note. Gracious benefactors, show kind charity to the girl christened Arina, and we will join with her to send our tears to the heavenly throne for you forever and congratulate you on your name day, persons unknown to you. Then Nikolai Semyonovich, for whom I have such a respect, greatly disappointed me. He drew a very long face and decided to send the child at once to the foundling home. I felt very sad. They lived very frugally but had no children, and Nikolai Semyonovich was always glad of it. I carefully took little Arina out of the basket and held her up under the arms. The basket had that sour, pungent odor characteristic of a small child which has not been washed for a long time. I opposed Nikolai Semyonovich and suddenly announced that I would keep the child at my expense. In spite of his gentleness, he protested with some severity. And though he ended by joking, he adhered to his intention in regard to the foundling. I got my way, however. In the same block of buildings, but in a different wing, there lived a very poor carpenter, an elderly man given to drink. But his wife, a very healthy and still youngish peasant woman, had only just lost a baby, and what is more, the only child she had had in eight years of marriage, also a girl, and by a strange piece of luck, also called Arena. I call it good luck, because while we were arguing in the kitchen, the woman hearing of what had happened ran in to look at the child, and when she learned that it was called Arena, she was greatly touched. She still had milk, and unfastening her dress, she put the baby to her breast. I began persuading her to take the child home with her, saying I would pay for it every month. She was afraid her husband would not allow it, but she took it for the night. Next morning, her husband consented to her keeping it for eight rubles a month, and I immediately paid him for the first month in advance. He at once spent the money on drink. Nikolai Semyonovich, still with a strange smile, agreed to guarantee that the money should be paid regularly every month. I would have given my sixty rubles into Nikolai Semyonovich's keeping as security, but he would not take it. He knew, however, that I had the money and trusted me. Our momentary quarrel was smoothed over by this delicacy on his part. Marie Ivanovna said nothing, but wondered at my undertaking such a responsibility. I particularly appreciated their delicacy in refraining from the slightest jest at my expense, but on the contrary, taking the matter with proper seriousness. I used to run over to the carpenter's wife three times a day, and at the end of the week I slipped an extra three rubles into her hand without her husband's knowledge. For another three, I bought a little quilt and swaddling clothes, but ten days later, little Arena fell ill. I called in a doctor at once, he wrote a prescription, and we were up all night tormenting the mite with horrid medicine. Next day he declared that he had been sent for too late, and answered my entreaties, which I fancy were more like reproaches, by saying with majestic evasiveness, I am not God. The baby's little tongue and lips and whole mouth were covered with a minute white rash, and towards evening she died, gazing at me with her big black eyes, as though she understood already. I don't know why I never thought to take a photograph of the dead baby, but will it be believed that I cried that evening, and in fact I howled as I had never let myself do before, and Marie Ivanovna had to try to comfort me again without the least mockery either on her part or on Nikolai Semyonovich's. The carpenter made a little coffin, and Marie Ivanovna finished it with a frill and a pretty little pillow, while I bought flowers and strewed them on the baby. So they carried away my poor little Blossom, whom it will hardly be believed I can't forget even now. A little afterwards, however, this sudden adventure made me reflect seriously. Little Arena had not cost me much, of course. The coffin, the burial, the doctor, the flowers, and the payment to the carpenter's wife came altogether to thirty rubles. As I was going to Petersburg, I made up this sum from the forty rubles sent me by Versilov for the journey and from the sale of various articles before my departure, so that my capital remained intact. But I thought, if I am going to be turned aside like this, I shan't get far. The affair with the student showed that the idea might absorb me till it blurred my impressions and drew me away from the realities of life. The incident with little Arena proved, on the contrary, that no idea was strong enough to absorb me, at least so completely that I should not stop short in the face of an overwhelming fact and sacrifice to it at once all that I had done for the idea by years of labor. Both conclusions were nevertheless true. End of Part 1, Chapter 5
read by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. Part 1, Chapter 6 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnet. Part 1, Chapter 6 one my hopes were not fully realized i did not find them alone though versilov was not at home tatiana pavlovna was sitting with my mother and she was after all not one of the family fully half of my magnanimous feelings disappeared instantly it is wonderful how hasty and changeable i am in such cases a straw a grain of sand is enough to dissipate my good mood and replace it by a bad one my bad impressions i regret to say are not so quickly dispelled though i am not resentful when i went in i had a feeling that my mother immediately and hastily broke off what she was saying to tatiana pavlovna i fancied they were talking very eagerly my sister turned from her work only for a moment to look at me and did not come out of her little alcove again the flat consisted of three rooms the room in which we usually sat the middle room or drawing-room was fairly large and almost presentable in it were soft red armchairs and a sofa very much the worse for wear however versilov could not endure covers on furniture there were rugs of a sort and several tables including some useless little ones on the right was versilov's room cramped and narrow with one window it was furnished with a wretched-looking writing-table covered with unused books and crumpled papers and an equally wretched-looking easy-chair with a broken spring that stuck up in one corner and often made versilov groan and swear on an equally threadbare sofa in this room he used to sleep he hated this study of his and i believe he never did anything in it he preferred sitting idle for hours together in the drawing-room on the left of the drawing-room there was another room of the same sort in which my mother and sister slept the drawing-room was entered from the passage at the end of which was the kitchen where the cook lucaria lived and when she cooked she ruthlessly filled the whole flat with the smell of burnt fat there were moments when versilov cursed his life and fate aloud on account of the smell from the kitchen and in that one matter i sympathized with him fully i hated that smell too though it did not penetrate to my room i lived upstairs in an attic under the roof to which i climbed by a very steep and shaky ladder the only things worth mentioning in it were a semicircular window a low-pitched ceiling a sofa covered with american leather on which at night lucaria spread sheets and put a pillow for me the rest of the furniture consisted of two articles a perfectly plain deal table and a wooden rush-bottomed chair we still preserved however some relics of former comfort in the drawing-room for instance we had a fairly decent china lamp and on the wall hung a large and splendid engraving of the sistine madonna facing it on the other wall was an immense and expensive photograph of the cast bronze gates of the cathedral of florence 
in the corner of the same room was a shrine of old-fashioned family icons one of which had a gilt silver setting the one they had meant to pawn while another the image of our lady had a velvet setting embroidered in pearls under the icons hung a little lamp which was lighted on every holiday versilov evidently had no feeling for the icons in their inner meaning and religious significance but he restrained himself he merely screwed up his eyes sometimes complaining that the lamplight reflected in the gilt setting hurt them but he did not hinder my mother from lighting the lamp i usually entered in gloomy silence looking away into some corner and sometimes without even greeting any one as a rule i returned earlier than to-day and they used to send my dinner to me upstairs going into the room i said good evening mother a thing i had never done before though even this time i was unable from a sort of bashfulness to make myself look at her and i sat down in the opposite corner of the room i was awfully tired but i did not think of that that lout of yours still walks in as rudely as ever tatiana pavlovna hissed at me she had been in the habit in old days of using abusive epithets to me and it had become an established tradition between us my mother faltered good evening to me using the formal mode of address and evidently embarrassed at my greeting her your dinner has been ready a long while she added almost overcome by confusion i hope the soup is not cold i will order the cutlets at once she was hastily jumping up to go to the kitchen and for the first time perhaps during that whole month i felt ashamed that she should run about to wait on me so humbly though till that moment i had expected it of her thank you very much mother i have had dinner already may i stay and rest here if i am not in the way oh of course how can you ask pray sit down don't worry yourself mother i won't be rude to andrei petrovitch again i rapped out all at once good heavens how noble of him cried tatiana pavlovna sonia darling you don't mean to say you still stand on ceremony with him who is he to be treated with such deference and by his own mother too look at you why you behave as though you were afraid of him it is disgraceful i should like it very much mother if you would call me arkasha oh yes certainly yes i will my mother said hurriedly i don't always henceforward i will she blushed all over certainly her face had at times a great charm it had a look of simplicity but by no means of stupidity it was rather pale and anaemic her cheeks were very thin even hollow her forehead was already lined by many wrinkles but there were none round her eyes and her eyes were rather large and wide open and shone with a gentle and serene light which had drawn me to her from the very first day i liked her face too because it did not look particularly depressed or drawn on the contrary her expression would have been positively cheerful if she had not been so often agitated sometimes almost panic-stricken over trifles starting up from her seat for nothing at all or listening in alarm to anything new that was said till she was sure that all was well and as before what mattered to her was just that all should be as before that there should be no change that nothing new should happen not even new happiness it might have been thought that she had been frightened as a child besides her eyes i like the oval of her rather long face and i believe if it had been a shade less broad across the cheek-bones she might have been called beautiful not only in her youth but even now she was not more than thirty-nine but grey hairs were already visible in her chestnut hair tatiana pavlovna glanced at her in genuine indignation a booby like him and you tremble before him you are ridiculous sophia you make me angry i tell you 
ah tatiana pavlovna why should you attack him now but you are joking perhaps eh my mother added detecting something like a smile on tatiana pavlovna's face her scoldings could not indeed be always taken seriously but she smiled if she did smile only at my mother of course because she loved her devotedly and no doubt noticed how happy she was at that moment at my meekness of course i can't help feeling hurt if you will attack people unprovoked tatiana pavlovna and just when i've come in saying good evening mother a thing i've never done before i thought it necessary to observe at last only fancy she boiled over it once he considers it as something to be proud of am i to go down on my knees to you pray because for once in your life you've been polite and as though it were politeness why do you stare into the corner when you come in i know how you tear and fling about before her you might have said good evening to me too i wrapped you in your swaddling clothes i am your godmother i need not say i did not deign to answer at that moment my sister came in and i made haste to turn to her liza i saw vassin to-day and he inquired after you you have met him yes last year in luga she answered quite simply sitting down beside me and looking at me affectionately i don't know why but i had fancied she would flush when i spoke of vassin my sister was a blonde very fair with flaxen hair quite unlike both her parents but her eyes and the oval of her face were like our mother's her nose was very straight small and regular there were tiny freckles in her face however of which there was no sign in my mother's there was very little resemblance to versilov nothing but the slenderness of figure perhaps her tallness and something charming in her carriage there was not the slightest likeness between us we were the opposite poles i knew his honour for three months liza added is it vassin you call his honour liza you should call him by his name excuse my correcting you sister but it grieves me that they seem to have neglected your education but it's shameful of you to remark upon it before your mother cried tatiana pavlovna firing up and you are talking nonsense it has not been neglected at all i am not saying anything about my mother i said sharply defending myself do you know mother that when i look at liza it's as though it were you over again you have given her the same charm of goodness which you must have had yourself and you have it to this day and always will have it i was only talking of the surface polish of the silly rules of etiquette which are necessary however i am only indignant at the thought that when versilov has heard you call vass in his honour he has not troubled to correct you at all his disdain and his indifference to us are so complete that's what makes me furious he is a perfect bear himself and he is giving us lessons in good manners don't you dare talk of versilov before your mother sir or before me either i won't stand it tatiana pavlovna flashed out i got my salary to-day mother fifty roubles take it please here i went up to her and gave her the money she was in a tremor of anxiety at once oh i don't know about taking it she brought out as though afraid to touch the money i did not understand for goodness sake mother if you both think of me as one of the family as a son and a brother oh i've been to blame arcady i ought to have confessed something to you but i'm afraid of you she said this with a timid and deprecating smile again i did not understand and interrupted by the way did you know mother that andrey petrovitch's case against the sokolskys is being decided to-day ah i knew she cried clasping her hands before her her favourite gesture in alarm to-day 
cried tatiana pavlovna startled but it's impossible he would have told us did he tell you she turned to my mother oh no that it was to-day he didn't but i have been fearing it all the week i would have prayed for him to lose it even only to have it over and off it one's mind and to have things as they used to be again what hasn't he even told you mother i exclaimed what a man there's an example of the indifference and contempt i spoke of just now it's being decided how is it being decided and who told you cried tatiana pavlovna pouncing upon me speak do why here he is himself perhaps he will tell you i announced catching the sound of his step in the passage and hastily sitting down again beside eliza brother for god's sake spare mother and be patient with andrei petrovitch she whispered to me i will i will with that i turned to her and pressed her hand liza looked at me very mistrustfully and she was right two he came in very much pleased with himself so pleased that he did not feel it necessary to conceal his state of mind and indeed he had become accustomed of late to displaying himself before us without the slightest ceremony not only in his bad points but even where he was ridiculous a thing which most people are afraid to do at the same time he fully recognized that we should understand to the smallest detail in the course of the last year so tatiana pavlovna observed he had become slovenly in his dress his clothes though old were always well cut and free from foppishness it is true that he was prepared to put on clean linen only on every alternate day instead of every day which was a real distress to my mother it was regarded by them as a sacrifice and the whole group of devoted women looked upon it as an act of heroism he always wore soft wide-brimmed black hats when he took off his hat his very thick but silvery locks stood up in a shock on his head i liked looking at his hair when he took off his hat good evening still disputing and is he actually one of the party i heard his voice from outside in the passage he has been attacking me i suppose it was one of the signs of his being in a good humour for him to be witty at my expense i did not answer of course lucaria came in with a regular sackful of parcels and put them on the table victory tatiana pavlovna the case is won and the sokolskys certainly won't venture to appeal i've won the day i was able to borrow a thousand roubles at once sonia put down your work don't try your eyes back from work liza yes father answered liza looking at him affectionately she used to call him father nothing would have induced me to submit to doing the same tired yes give up your work don't go to-morrow and drop it altogether father that will be worse for me i beg you will i greatly dislike to see women working tatiana pavlovna how can they get on without work a woman's not to work i know i know that's excellent and very true and i agree with it beforehand but i mean needlework particularly only imagine i believe that's one of the morbid anomalous impressions of my childhood in my dim memories of the time when i was five or six years old i remember more often than anything with loathing of course a solemn council of wise women stern and forbidding sitting at a round table with scissors material patterns and a fashion plate they thought they knew all about it and shook their heads slowly and majestically measuring calculating and preparing to cut out all those kind people who were so fond of me had suddenly become unapproachable and if i began to play i was carried out of the room at once even my poor nurse who held me by the hand and took no notice of my shouting and pulling at her was listening and gazing enraptured as though at a kind of paradise the sternness of those sensible faces and the solemnity with which 
they face the task of cutting out is for some reason distressing for me to picture even now tatiana pavlovna you are awfully fond of cutting out although it may be aristocratic yet i do prefer a woman who does not work at all don't take that as meant for you sonia how could you indeed woman is an immense power without working you know that though sonia what's your opinion arkady markovitch no doubt you disagree no not at all i answered that's a particularly good saying that woman is an immense power though i don't understand why you say that about work and she can't help working if she has no money as you know yourself well that's enough and he turned to my mother who positively beamed all over when he addressed me she was all of a tremor at least to begin with i beg you not to let me see you doing needlework for me no doubt arcady as a young man of the period you are something of a socialist well would you believe it my dear fellow none are so fond of idleness as the toiling masses rest perhaps not idleness no idleness doing nothing that's their ideal i knew a man who was for ever at work though he was not one of the common people he was rather intellectual and capable of generalizing every day of his life perhaps he brooded with blissful emotion on visions of utter idleness raising the ideal to infinity so to speak to unlimited independence to everlasting freedom dreaming and idle contemplation so it went on till he broke down altogether from overwork there was no mending him he died in a hospital i am sometimes seriously disposed to believe that the delights of labour have been invented by the idle from virtuous motives of course it is one of the geneva ideas of the end of last century tatiana pavlovna i cut an advertisement out of the newspaper the day before yesterday here it is he took a scrap of paper out of his waistcoat pocket it is one of those everlasting students proficient in classics and mathematics and prepared to travel to sleep in a garret or anywhere here listen a teacher lady prepares for all the scholastic establishments do you hear for all and gives lessons in arithmetic prepares for all the scholastic establishments in arithmetic therefore may we assume no arithmetic is something apart for her it is a case of simple hunger the last extremity of want it is just the ineptitude of it that's so touching it's evident that the lady has never prepared any one for any school and it is doubtful whether she is fit to teach anything yet at her last gasp she wastes her one remaining rouble and prints in the paper that she prepares for all the scholastic establishments and what's more gives lessons in arithmetic per tuto mundo e in altri city oh andrei petrovitch she ought to be helped where does she live cried tatiana pavlovna oh there are lots of them he put the advertisement in his pocket that bag's full of treats for you liza and you tatiana pavlovna sonia and i don't care for sweet things and perhaps for you young man i bought the things myself at eliseyev's and at ballet's too long we've gone hungry as lucaria said note well none of us had ever gone hungry here are grapes sweets duchesses and strawberry tarts i've even brought some excellent liqueur nuts too it's curious that to this day i'm fond of nuts as i have been from a child tatiana pavlovna and of the commonest nuts do you know liza takes after me she is fond of cracking nuts like a squirrel but there's nothing more charming tatiana pavlovna than sometimes when recalling one's childhood to imagine oneself in a wood in a copse gathering nuts the days are almost autumnal but bright at times it's so fresh one hides in the bushes one wanders in the wood there's a scent of leaves i seem to see something sympathetic in your face arkady makarovitch 
the early years of my childhood too were spent in the country but i thought you were brought up in moscow if i am not mistaken he was living in moscow at the andronikovs when you went there but till then he used to live in the country with your aunt Va vara stepanovna tatiana pavlovna put in sonia here's some money put it away i promise you in a few days five thousand so there's no hope then for the sokolskys asked tatiana pavlovna absolutely none tatiana pavlovna i've always sympathized with you and all of yours andrei petrovitch and i've always been a friend of the family but though the sokolskys are strangers yet upon my word i'm sorry for them don't be angry andrei petrovitch i have no intention of going shares with them tatiana pavlovna you know my idea of course andrei petrovitch they would have settled the case out of court if at the very beginning you had offered to go halves with them now of course it is too late not that i venture to criticise i say so because i don't think the deceased would have left them out of his will altogether not only he wouldn't have left them out he'd have certainly left them everything and would have left none out but me if he'd known how to do things and to write a will properly but as it is the law's on my side and it's settled i can't go shares and i don't want to tatiana pavlovna and that is the end of the matter he spoke with real exasperation a thing he rarely allowed himself to do tatiana pavlovna subsided my mother looked down mournfully versilov knew that she shared tatiana pavlovna's views he has not forgotten that slap in the face at ems i thought to myself the document given me by craft and at that moment in my pocket would have a poor chance if it had fallen into his hands i suddenly felt that the whole responsibility was still weighing upon me and this idea together with all the rest had of course an irritating effect upon me arcady i should like you to be better dressed my dear fellow your suit is all right but for future contingencies i might recommend you to an excellent frenchman most conscientious and possessed of taste i beg you never to make such suggestions again i burst out suddenly what's that it is not that i consider it humiliating of course but we are not agreed about anything on the contrary our views are entirely opposed for in a day or two to-morrow i shall give up going to the princess as i find there is absolutely no work for me to do there but you are going and sitting there with him that is the work such ideas are degrading i don't understand but if you are so squeamish don't take money from him but simply go you will distress him horribly he has already become attached to you i assure you however as you please he was evidently put out you say don't ask for money but thanks to you i did a mean thing to-day you did not warn me and i demanded my month's salary from him to-day so you have seen to that already i confess i did not expect you to ask for it but how sharp you all are nowadays there are no young people in these days tatiana pavlovna he was very spiteful i was awfully angry too i ought to have had things out with you you made me do it i don't know now how it's to be by the way sonia give arcady back his sixty roubles at once and you my dear fellow don't be angry at our repaying it so quickly i can guess from your face that you have some enterprise in your mind and that you need it so invest it or something of the sort i don't know what my face expresses but i did not expect mother would have told you of that money when i so particularly asked her i looked at my mother with flashing eyes i cannot express how wounded i felt our kasha darling for god's sake forgive me i couldn't possibly help speaking of it my dear fellow don't make a grievance of her telling me your secrets besides she did it with the best intentions it was simply a mother's longing to boast of her son's feeling for her but i assure you i should have guessed without that you were a capitalist all your secrets are written on your honest countenance he has his idea tatiana pavlovna as i told you 
let's drop my honest countenance i burst out again i know that you often see right through things but in some cases you see no further than your own nose and i have marvelled at your powers of penetration well then i had my idea that you should use the expression of course was an accident but i am not afraid to admit it i have an idea of my own i am not afraid and i am not ashamed of it don't be ashamed that's the chief thing and all the same i shall never tell it you that's to say you won't condescend to no need to my dear fellow i know the nature of your idea as it is in any case it implies into the wilderness i flee tatiana pavlovna my notion is that he wants to become a rothschild or something of the kind and shut himself up in his grandeur no doubt he'll magnanimously allow us a pension though perhaps he won't allow me one but in any case he will vanish from our sight like the new moon he has risen only to set again i shuddered in my inmost being of course it was all chance he knew nothing of my idea and was not speaking about it though he did mention rothschild but how could he define my feelings so precisely my impulse to break with him and go away he divined everything and wanted to defile beforehand with his cynicism the tragedy of fact that he was horribly angry of that there could be no doubt mother forgive my hastiness for i see that there is no hiding things from andre petrovitch in any case i said affecting to laugh and trying if only for a moment to turn it into a joke that's the very best thing you can do my dear fellow to laugh it is difficult to realize how much every one gains by laughing even in appearance i am speaking most seriously he always has an air tatiana pavlovna of having something so important on his mind that he is quite abashed at the circumstance himself i must ask you in earnest andrei petrovitch to be more careful what you say you are right my dear boy but one must speak out once for all so as never to touch upon the matter again you have come to us from moscow to begin making trouble at once that's all we know as yet of your object in coming i say nothing of course of your having come to surprise us in some way and all this month you have been snorting and sneering at us yet you are obviously an intelligent person and as such you might leave such snorting and sneering to those who have no other means of avenging themselves on others for their own insignificance you are always shutting yourself up though your honest countenance and your rosy cheeks bear witness that you might look every one straight in the face with perfect innocence he's a neurotic i can't make out tatiana pavlovna why they are all neurotic nowadays if you did not even know where i was brought up you are not likely to know why a man's neurotic oh so that's the key to it you are offended at my being capable of forgetting where you were brought up not in the least don't attribute such silly ideas to me mother andrei petrovitch praised me just now for laughing let us laugh why sit like this shall i tell you a little anecdote about myself especially as andrei petrovitch knows nothing of my adventures i was boiling i knew this was the last time we should be sitting together like this that when i left that house i should never enter it again so on the eve of it all i could not restrain myself he had challenged me to such a parting scene himself that will be delightful of course if it is really amusing he observed looking at me searchingly your manners were rather neglected where you were brought up my dear fellow though they are pretty passable he is charming to-day tatiana pavlovna and it's a good thing you have undone that bag at last but tatiana pavlovna frowned she did not even turn round at his words but went on untying the parcels and laying out the good things on some plates which had been brought in my mother too was sitting in complete bewilderment though she had misgivings of course and realized that there would be trouble between us my sister touched my elbow again three 
i simply want to tell you all i began with a very free and easy air how a father met for the first time a dearly loved son it happened wherever you were brought up my dear fellow won't it be a dull story you know to les genres don't frown andre petrovitch i am not speaking at all with the object you imagine all i want is to make every one laugh well god hears you my dear boy i know that you love us all and don't want to spoil our evening he mumbled with a sort of affected carelessness of course you have guessed by my face that i love you yes partly by your face too just as i guessed from her face that tatiana pavlovna's in love with me don't look at me so ferociously tatiana pavlovna it is better to laugh it is better to laugh she turned quickly to me and gave me a searching look which lasted half a minute mine now she said holding up her finger at me but so earnestly that her words could not have referred to my stupid joke but must have been meant as a warning in case i might be up to some mischief andre petrovitch is it possible you don't remember how we met for the first time in our lives upon my word i've forgotten my dear fellow and i'm really very sorry all that i remember is that it was a long time ago and took place somewhere mother and don't you remember how you were in the country where i was brought up till i was six or seven i believe or rather were you really there once or is it simply a dream that i saw you there for the first time i've been wanting to ask you about it for a long time but i've kept putting it off now the time has come to be sure our kasha to be sure i stayed with varvara stepanovna three times my first visit was when you were only a year old i came a second time when you were nearly four and afterwards again when you were six ah oh, you did then i have been wanting to ask you about it all this month my mother seemed overwhelmed by a rush of memories and she asked me with feeling do you really mean our kasha that you remembered me there i don't know or remember anything only something of your face remained in my heart for the rest of my life and the fact too that you were my mother i recall everything there as though it were a dream i have even forgotten my nurse i have a faint recollection of bavara stepanovna simply that her face was tied up for toothache i remember huge trees near the house lime trees i think they were then sometimes the brilliant sunshine at the open windows the little flower garden the little paths and you mother i remember clearly only at one moment when i was taken to the church there and you held me up to receive the sacrament and to kiss the chalice it was in the summer and a dove flew through the cupola in at one window and out at another mercy on us that's just how it was cried my mother throwing up her hands and the dear dove i remember too now with the chalice just before you you started and cried out a dove a dove your face or something of the expression remained in my memory so distinctly that i recognized you five years after in moscow though nobody there told me you were my mother but when i met andrei petrovitch for the first time i was brought from the andronikovs i had been vegetating quietly and happily with them for five years on end i remember their flat down to the smallest detail and all those ladies who have all grown so much older here and the whole household and how andronikov himself used to bring the provisions poultry fish and sucking pigs from the town in a fish basket and how at dinner instead of his wife who always gave herself such airs he used to help the soup and how we all laughed at his doing it he most of all the young ladies there used to teach me french but what i liked best of all was krylov's fables i learned a number of them by heart and every day i used to recite one to andronikov going straight into his tiny study to do so without considering whether he were busy or not well it was through a fable of krylov's that i got to know you andrei petrovitch i see you are beginning to remember i do recall something my dear fellow that you repeated something to me a fable or a passage from woe from wit i fancy what a memory you have though 
a memory i should think so it's the one thing i've remembered all my life that's all right that's all right my dear fellow you are quite waking me up he actually smiled as soon as he smiled my mother and sister smiled after him confidence was restored but tatiana pavlovna who had finished laying out the good things on the table and settled herself in a corner still bent upon me a keen and disapproving eye this is how it happened i went on one fine morning there suddenly appeared the friend of my childhood tatiana pavlovna who always made her entrance on the stage of my existence with dramatic suddenness she took me away in a carriage to a grand house to sumptuous apartments you were staying at madame vanariatov's andrei petrovitch in her empty house which she had bought from you she was abroad at that time i always used to wear short jackets now all of a sudden i was put into a pretty little blue greatcoat and a very fine shirt tatiana pavlovna was busy with me all day and bought me lots of things i kept walking through all the empty rooms looking at myself in all the looking-glasses and wandering about in the same way the next morning at ten o'clock i walked quite by chance into your study i had seen you already the evening before as soon as i was brought into the house but only for an instant on the stairs you were coming downstairs to get into your carriage and drive off somewhere you were staying alone in moscow then for a short time after a very long absence so that you had engagements in all directions and were scarcely ever at home when you met tatiana pavlovna and me you only drawled ah and did not even stop he describes it with a special love observed versilov addressing tatiana pavlovna she turned away and did not answer i can see you now as you were then handsome and flourishing it is wonderful how much older and less good-looking you have grown in these years please forgive this candour you were thirty-seven even then though i gazed at you with admiration what wonderful hair you had almost jet black with a brilliant lustre without a trace of grey moustaches and whiskers like the setting of a jewel i can find no other expression for it your face of an even pallor not like it sickly pallor to-day but like your daughter anna andreyevna whom i had the honour of seeing this morning dark glowing eyes and gleaming teeth especially when you laughed and you did laugh when you looked round as i came in i was not very discriminating at that time and your smile rejoiced my heart that morning you were wearing a dark blue velvet jacket a sulphur-coloured necktie and a magnificent shirt with alencon lace on it you were standing before the looking-glass with a manuscript in your hand and were busy declaiming tchatsky's monologue and especially his last exclamation a coach i want a coach good heavens cried versilov why he's right though i was only in moscow for so short a time i undertook to play tchatsky in an amateur performance at alexandra petrovna vitovtov's in place of zileko who was ill do you mean to say you had forgotten it laughed tatiana pavlovna he has brought it back to my mind and i own that those few days in moscow were perhaps the happiest in my life we were still so young then and all so fervently expecting something it was then in moscow i unexpectedly met so much but go on my dear fellow this time you've done well to remember it all so exactly i stood still to look at you and suddenly cried out ah how good the real tchatsky you turned round at once and asked why do you know tchatsky already and you sat down on a sofa and began drinking your coffee in the most charming humour i could have kissed you then i informed you that at the andronikoffs every one read a great deal and that the young ladies knew a great deal of poetry by heart and used to act scenes out of woe from wit among themselves and that all last week we had been reading aloud in the evening of sportsman's sketches but what i liked best of all was krylov's fables and that i knew them by heart you told me to repeat one and i repeated the girl who was hard to please i made her suitor shrewdly scanned 
yes yes i remember it all now cried versaloff again but my dear fellow i remember you too clearly now you were such a charming boy then a thoughtful boy even and i assure you you too have changed for the worse in the course of these nine years at this point all of them even tatiana pavlovna laughed it was evident that andrei petrovitch had deigned to jest and had paid me out in the same coin for my biting remark about his having grown old every one was amused and indeed it was well said as i recited you smiled but before i was half-way through the fable you rang the bell and told the footman who answered it to ask tatiana pavlovna to come and she ran in with such a delighted face that though i had seen her the evening before i scarcely knew her for tatiana pavlovna i began the fable again i finished it brilliantly even tatiana pavlovna smiled and you andrei petrovitch cried bravo and observed with warmth that if it had been the ant and the grasshopper it would not be wonderful that a sensible boy of my age should recite it sensibly but this fable a maid her suitor shrewdly scanned indeed that's not a crime was different listen how he brings out indeed that's not a crime you said in fact you were enthusiastic then you said something in french to tatiana pavlovna and she instantly frowned and began to protest and grew very hot in fact but as it was impossible to oppose andrei petrovitch if he once took an idea into his head she hurriedly carried me off to her room there my hands and face were washed again my shirt was changed my hair was pomaded and even curled then towards evening tatiana pavlovna dressed herself up rather grandly as i had never expected to see her and she took me with her in the carriage it was the first time in my life i had been to a play it was at a private performance of madame fitoftoff's the lights the chandeliers the ladies the officers the generals the young ladies the curtain the rows of chairs were utterly unlike anything i had seen before tatiana pavlovna took a very modest seat in front of the back rows and made me sit down beside her there were of course other children like me in the room but i had no eyes for anything i simply waited with a sinking of my heart for the performance when you came on andrei petrovitch i was ecstatic to the point of tears what for and why i don't understand why those tears of rapture it has been a strange recollection for me ever since for these last nine years i followed the drama with a throbbing heart all i understood of it of course was that she was deceiving him and that he was ridiculed by stupid people who were not worth his little finger when he was reciting at the ball i understood that he was humiliated and insulted that he was reproaching all these miserable people but that he was great great no doubt my training at the andronikoffs helped me to understand and your acting andrei petrovitch it was the first time i had seen a play when you were, went off shouting a coach a coach and you did that shout wonderfully i jumped up from my seat and while the whole audience burst into applause i too clapped my hands and cried bravo at the top of my voice i vividly recall how at that instant i felt as though i had been pierced by a pin in my back a little below the waist tatiana pavlovna had given me a ferocious pinch but i took no notice of it as soon as woe from wit was over tatiana pavlovna took me home of course you can't stay for the dancing and it's only on your account i am not staying you hissed at me all the way home in the carriage tatiana pavlovna all night i was delirious and by ten o'clock the next morning i was standing at the study door but it was shut there were people with you and you were engaged in some business with them then you drove off and were away the whole day till late at night so i did not see you again what i meant to say to you i have forgotten of course and indeed i did not know then but i longed passionately to see you as soon as possible and at eight o'clock next morning you were graciously pleased to set off for sir Puhoff at that time you had just sold your tula estate to settle with your creditors but there was still left in your hands a tempting stake that was why you had come at that time to moscow where you had not been able to show yourself to them 
for fear of your creditors and this sir poo hoff ruffian was the only one of them who had not agreed to take half of what you owed him instead of the whole when i questioned tatiana pavlovna she did not even answer me it's no business of yours but the day after to-morrow i shall take you to your boarding-school get your exercise books ready take your lesson books put them all in order and you must learn to pack your little box yourself you can't expect to be waited on sir you were drumming this and that into my ears all those three days tatiana pavlovna it ended in my being taken in my innocence to school at two shards adoring you andrei petrovitch our whole meeting was a trivial incident perhaps but would you believe it six months afterwards i longed to run away from two shards to you you describe it capitally you have brought it all back so vividly versilov pronounced incisively but what strikes me most in your story is the wealth of certain strange details concerning my debts for instance apart from the fact that these details are hardly a suitable subject for you to discuss i can't imagine how you managed to get hold of them details how i got hold of them why i repeat for the last nine years i have been doing nothing but getting hold of facts about you a strange confession and a strange way of spending your time he turned half reclining in his easy chair and even yawned slightly whether intentionally or not i could not say well shall i go on telling you how i wanted to run to you from two shards forbid him andrei petrovitch suppress him and send him away tatiana pavlovna burst out that won't do tatiana pavlovna versilov answered her impressively our kasha has evidently something on his mind and so he must be allowed to finish well let him speak when he's said what he's got to say it will be off his mind and what matters most to him is that he should get it off his mind begin your new story my dear fellow i call it new but you may rest assured that i know how it ends four i ran away that is i tried to run away to you very simply tatiana pavlovna do you remember after i had been there a fortnight to shard wrote you a letter didn't he marie ivanovna showed me the letter afterwards that turned up among andronikoff's papers too to shar suddenly discovered that the fees he had asked were too small and with dignity announced in his letter to you that little princes and senators children were educated in his establishment and that it was lowering its tone to keep a pupil of such humble origin as me unless the remuneration were increased mon cher you really might oh that's nothing that's nothing i interrupted i'm only going to say a little about two shard you wrote from the provinces a fortnight later tatiana pavlovna and answered with a flat refusal i remember how he walked into our class-room flushing crimson he was a very short thick-set little frenchman of five-and-forty a parisian cobbler by origin though he had from time immemorial held a position in moscow as an instructor in the french language and even had an official rank of which he was extremely proud he was a man of crass ignorance there were only six of us pupils among them there actually was a nephew of a moscow senator and we all lived like one family under the supervision of his wife a very affected lady who was the daughter of a russian government clerk during that fortnight i had given myself great airs before my schoolfellows i boasted of my blue overcoat and my papa andrei petrovitch and their questions why i was called dolgoruki and not versilov did not embarrass me in the least since i did not know why andrei petrovitch cried tatiana pavlovna in a voice almost menacing my mother on the contrary was watching me intently and evidently wished me to go on sir touchard i actually recall him now he was a fussy little man versilov admitted but he was recommended to me by the very best people sir touchard walked in with the letter in his hand went up to the big oak table at which all six of us were seated learning something by heart he seized me firmly by the shoulder picked me up from the chair and ordered me to collect my exercise books your place is not here but there he said pointing to a tiny room on the left of the passage where there was nothing but a plain deal table a rush-bottomed chair and an american leather sofa 
exactly like what i have upstairs in the attic i went into it in amazement very much downcast i had never been roughly treated before half an hour later when two shar had gone out of the schoolroom i began to exchange glances and smiles with my schoolfellows they of course were laughing at me and i had no suspicion of it and thought we were laughing because we were merry at that moment two shar darted in seized me by the forelock and dragged me about don't you dare sit with gentlemanly boys you are a child of low origin and no better than a lackey and he gave me a stinging blow on my chubby rosy cheek he must have enjoyed doing so and he struck me a second time and a third i cried violently and was terribly astonished for a whole hour i sat with my face hidden in my hands crying and crying something had happened which was utterly beyond my comprehension i don't understand how a man not of spiteful character a foreigner like Tushar, who rejoiced at the emancipation of the russian peasants could have beaten a foolish child like me i was only amazed not resentful however i had not yet learnt to resent an insult it seemed to me that i had somehow been naughty that when i was good again i should be forgiven and that we should all be merry again at once that we should go out to play in the yard and live happy ever after my dear fellow if i had only known versilov drawled with the careless smile of a rather weary man what a scoundrel that too shard was though i have not given up all hope however that you may make an effort and forgive us for all that at last and that we may all live happy ever after he yawned decisively but i am not blaming you at all and believe me i am not complaining of too shar i cried a little disconcerted though indeed he beat me for ten months or so i remember i was always trying to appease him in some way i used to rush to kiss his hands i was always kissing them and i was always crying and crying my schoolfellows laughed at me and despised me because too shar began to treat me sometimes like a servant he used to order me to bring him his clothes when he was dressing my menial instincts were of use to me there i did my very utmost to please him and was not in the least offended because i did not at that time understand it at all and i am surprised to this day that i could have been so stupid as not to realize that i was not on an equal footing with the rest it's true my schoolfellows made many things clear to me even then it was a good school tushar came in the end to prefer giving me a kick to slapping me in the face and six months later he even began to be affectionate only he never failed to beat me once a month or so to remind me not to forget myself he soon let me sit with the other boys too and allowed me to play with them but not once during those two and a half years did tushar forget the difference in our social positions and from time to time though not very frequently he employed me in menial tasks i verily believe to remind me of it i was running away that's to say i was on the point of running away for five months after those first two months i have always been slow in taking action when i got into bed and pulled the quilt over me i began thinking of you at once andrei petrovitch only of you of no one else i don't in the least know why it was so i dreamed about you too i used always to be passionately imagining that you would walk in and i would rush up to you and you would take me out of that place and bring me home with you to that same study and that we should go to the theatre again and so on above all that we should not part again that was the chief thing as soon as i had to wake up in the morning the jeers and contempt of the boys began again one of them actually began beating me and making me put on his boots for him he called me the vilest names particularly aiming at making my origin clear to me to the diversion of all who heard him when at last tushar himself became comprehensible something unbearable began in my soul i felt that i should never be forgiven here oh i was beginning by degrees to understand what it was they would not forgive me and of what i was guilty and so at last i resolved to run away for two whole months i dreamed of it incessantly at last it was september i made up my mind i waited for saturday when my schoolfellows used to go home for the weekend and meanwhile i secretly and carefully got together a bundle of the most necessary things all the money 
i had was two roubles i meant to wait till dusk then i will go downstairs i thought and i'll go out and walk away where i knew that andronikoff had moved to petersburg and i resolved that i would look for madame panariatoff's house in arbaty i'll spend the night walking or sitting somewhere and in the morning i'll ask someone in the courtyard of the house where andrei petrovitch is now if not in moscow in what town or country they will be sure to tell me i'll walk away and then ask someone somewhere else by which gate to go out to reach such a town and then i'll go and walk and walk i shall keep on walking i shall sleep somewhere under the bushes i shall eat nothing but bread and for two roubles i can get bread enough for a long time i could not manage to run away on saturday however i had to wait till next day sunday and as luck would have it tushar and his wife were going away somewhere for the sunday there was no one left in the house but agafya and me i waited the night in terrible agitation i remember i sat at the window in the schoolroom looking out at the dusty street the little wooden houses and the few passers-by tushard lived in an out-of-the-way street from the windows i could see one of the city gates isn't it the one i kept wondering the sun set in a red glow the sky was so cold-looking and a piercing wind was stirring up the dust just as it is to-day it was quite dark at last i stood before the icon and began to pray only very very quickly i was in haste i caught up my bundle and went on tiptoe down the creaking stairs horribly afraid that agafya would hear me from the kitchen the door was locked i turned the key and at once a dark dark night loomed black before me like a boundless perilous unknown land and the wind snatched off my cap i was just going out on the same side of the pavement i heard a hoarse volley of oaths from a drunken man in the street i stood looked and slowly turned slowly went upstairs slowly took off my things put down my little bundle and lay down flat without tears and without thoughts and it was from that moment andrei petrovitch that i began to think it was from that moment that i realized that besides being a lackey i was a coward too and my real development began well i see through you once and for all from this minute cried tatiana pavlovna jumping up from her seat and so suddenly that i was utterly unprepared for it yes you were not only a lackey then you are a lackey now you've the soul of a lackey why should not andrei petrovitch have apprenticed you to a shoemaker it would have been an act of charity to have taught you a trade who would have expected more than that of him your father makar ivanovitch asked in fact he insisted that you his children should not be brought up to be above your station why you think nothing of his having educated you for the university and that through him you have received class rights the little rascals teased him to be sure so he has sworn to avenge himself on humanity you scoundrel i must confess i was struck dumb by this outburst i got up and stood for some time staring and not knowing what to say well certainly tatiana pavlovna has told me something new i said at last turning resolutely to versilov yes certainly i am such a lackey that i can't be satisfied with versilov's not having apprenticed me to a shoemaker even rights did not touch me i wanted the whole of versilov i wanted a father that's what i asked for like a regular lackey mother i've had it on my conscience for eight years when you came to moscow alone to see me at two shards the way i received you then but i have no time to speak of it now tatiana pavlovna won't let me tell my story good-bye till to-morrow mother we may see each other again tatiana pavlovna what if i am so utterly a lackey that i am quite unable to admit the possibility of a man's marrying again when his wife is alive yet you know that all but happened to andrei petrovitch at ems mother if you don't want to stay with a husband who may take another wife to-morrow remember you have a son who promises to be a dutiful son to you for ever remember and let us go away only on condition that it is either he or i will you i don't ask you for an answer at once of course i know that such questions can't be answered straight off but i could not go on partly because i was excited and confused 
my mother turned pale and her voice seemed to fail her she could not utter a word tatiana pavlovna said something in a very loud voice and at great length which i could not make out and twice she pushed me on the shoulder with her fist i only remember that she shouted that my words were a sham the broodings of a petty soul counted over and turned inside out Bursilov sat motionless and very serious he was not smiling i went upstairs to my room the last thing i saw as i went out was the reproach in my sister's eyes she shook her head at me sternly End of part one chapter six